you dream of a classroom where learning is natural? Can we inspire students to lifelong learning? What exactly is the purpose of an education? Inspiring students to be curious, independent, creative, innovative, deep thinking, confident, proactive, collaborative, determined, educated. Rise to the challenge of changing the world. This is teaching. This is learning. This is who we are. Welcome to the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. Do you need a patent to make money on a great idea? What choices do inventors have to bring their ideas to market? Can you create a successful business as an art major? Listen in for the creative answers in today's podcast. Hey there, Innovation Nation. Today we're talking inventing, one of my favorite subjects, and I just read a great quote by the business strategist Gary Hamill. He says, as human beings, we are the only organisms that create for the sheer stupid pleasure of doing so. Whether it's laying out a garden, composing a new tune on the piano, writing a bit of poetry, manipulating a digital photo, redecorating a room, or inventing a new chili recipe, we are happiest when we are creating. I agree wholeheartedly, as does my guest on the podcast today, inventing coach Stephen Key. I just seem to lose track of time when I'm creating something, whether it be a recipe I'm developing or a 3D design I'm making and printing in our 3D printing lab. I am just happiest when I'm creating. We believe this idea so strongly that we've built a whole company around it, including one of our favorite activities, Inventors Bootcamp. We fill a room with 3D printers, embedded processors, sensors, 3D design software, and computers for programming, and then set students free to discover that ever dangerous idea. I can learn on my own. In every class, several students are set free to discover the universe without the limits imposed by others. To find out more about the Inventor's Bootcamp, visit ttinvent.com forward slash bootcampnow, all one word. Or just visit the ttinvent.com website and click the Inventor's Bootcamp button. Our guest today is a well-known inventor and coach to upcoming inventors. His students have been on the television show Shark Tank, and most of us have probably used one or more products designed and licensed by Stephen Key. Today's interview is a peek into the mind of a great inventor. So my guest today is Stephen Key. Stephen describes himself as a creative thinker with lots of ideas and he's looking to find homes for his ideas and he's written a great book about the power of licensing your ideas for the layman like myself called One Simple Idea Uh, but he's also got a new book called Sell Your Ideas Without a Patent that's a deeper dive on uh, licensing from a business perspective so Stephen tell us a little more about yourself oh wow Um, I'm just one of those individuals where when I was going to school I just didn't know what I was going to do and I found that I love working with my hands I've always been very creative I could sit in a corner with a few toys and time would just disappear so I just wanted to come up with ideas and find a home for those ideas and I've been able to do that for my whole career and it's been extremely rewarding as well So would it be okay if we went back in time a little bit and asked you some questions about how you got where you are? Absolutely. I struggled in school. There wasn't – I think I failed second grade. I was having a really hard time in school, and I wasn't quite sure what to do. But I was very fortunate. My parents gave me a lot of freedom, and sure enough, when I was in college, I was struggling, and I took an art class, and I found that I really loved to to work with my hands. I – changed my major. I became an uh, an art student and just found the love of creating things. But what do you do with that skill? I guess, I don't know. How do you make a living? So my father just let me play around with trying to come up with ideas and bring them to market myself. And I did that through art fairs and county fairs. And I would set up a little table and I'd put all the things I made. And if people bought them, I was extremely happy and And that's pretty much how it happened. I just wanted to be creative, and I wanted to share my creations with people. So how did the topic of patenting and licensing, and how did that come up in in your career? 
Well, I, I always felt that if I showed a company an idea and they liked it, they would pay me a royalty for it. And I didn't know it was called licensing. I just thought if I showed them a good idea, they would reward me. And sh sure enough, uh, I started showing my creations to companies and they liked them and they were they would pay me a royalty. That was very simple, and they were fun ideas. They were, in the, it was in the toy industry and the novelty gift industry. And, but one day that changed, and I had an idea. It was really an, an invention, and it had a very large market potential. And I called. I remember I was sitting at breakfast, and I had read this article how there was a problem. There was never enough information on labels. And I went down to my office at the time, and that was a, it was Kinko's, a little copy place, and I made this prototype. And I brought it home. I showed my wife, and she kind of rolled her eyes a little bit, and I said, I'm going to show this to a big company. <laughs> and I did. I called one of the big companies up, and sure enough, someone asked me what I had, and I sent them a sample, and the first thing out of their mouth was, do you have a patent on it? And that scared me. Uh, I wasn't aware of intellectual property. I didn't understand about patents, but I knew a big company wanted my idea. So quickly, I, I called a patent attorney and I started reading about patents, and I realized I was in in way over my head. Huh. Uh, I had a big company that wanted it. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to manufacture it. I didn't really understand that process. So that same idea I'm talking about t today is, has been on the market off and on through 20 years. There's over 20 patents on that idea. It's won awards just about around the world for it. And I wrote a book recently on how to sell an idea with a patent or without a patent because the majority of the items that I have licensed or sold have not had any intellectual property protection slash patents at all. And some of them need to have patents and some of them don't need to have patents. So that's why this book, uh, the new book, has been written. I actually became aware of uh, a little bit about your story a couple of years ago. A friend of mine is probably very much like you, but he didn't have the same experience, and he went off to work with his hands in a, a tradesman career. But he has all of these great ideas floating around in his head, and he keeps he keeps bringing these ideas to me, saying, "Hey, Steve, what do you think?" And I, I keep saying, "That's a great idea. You should do something with it." And he's like, "Yeah, I probably should." And then time goes by, right? <laughs> and Absolutely. So there's all these ideas floating around in his head. And one day I was listening to a podcast by Dan Miller called the 48 Days Podcast. And I listened to that quite a bit because I really like his perspective. He's really creative. He's a great business guy. He thinks about marketing in some interesting ways. And for a long time he's always said, well, if you have an idea, you can't really make money on an idea. You really have to go out and, and do the idea. And then someone came back to him, wrote him a little email and said, hey, you know, there's this book. And so he got the book. He read the book. And then on the podcast he said, you know what? I was wrong. I read the book. You can actually do this. And so whenever one, ever someone says, hey, I got this idea. What do I do? On the podcast he always says, oh, you have to go get Stephen Key's book, One Simple uh -huh. Idea. And and that's where I heard about it. And then and okay. so so then I heard that. And the next time my friend called and said, hey, I got this this other idea. I said, you got to read this book. <laughs> <laughs> I turned him on to your podcast, the Invent Right podcast, for a while and uh, listened to you and Andrew for a little bit. We very much liked the perspective of the idea that you don't have to go out and, and get a patent. Now, I actually have a couple of patents, so I know how, how, how much of a pain in the neck they are. And I would never go pay for one personally unless I thought it has, you know, had a lot of money value. And, oh, by the way, I'd read your book and, and do what your book says. <laughs> but my friend and I just had a great time thinking through the things that we would do. And, unfortunately, he's still kind of kicking his ideas around. So... Uh, that's sad. What he needs to do is what you say, go talk to a couple of companies and, sit and have them say, wow, that's amazing. You know, do you have a patent? <laughs> yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. Th that same story I hear over and over again, that people think you need to own something to license an idea. That's not true. Uh, and, you know, companies are looking for ideas. They'll license an idea from you if it has a patent pending status. So license it if it has a patented, you know, if it gets patented. But they'll also license it from you if it has no intellectual property whatsoever. And people don't realize that. They need us. They want good ideas, and they want us to keep coming back to them and, and working with them. So it's a little bit different than what people think it is. But that being said, 
it's important to understand intellectual property ownership. It's important to understand how that works because some ideas are going to require some ownership, perceived ownership, I, I like to call it, because I don't really <laughs> think you own anything. So, But I think most of my ideas were not patented, that, that were licensed. I think most of our students over the last 13 years have licensed ideas with only a patent pending, a PPA that they filed for $65, very affordable, anybody can do it. But the bottom line is companies need us and everybody's always surprised at that. And I, I mentioned everybody, we, we are experts. We're consumers, we know what we like and what we don't like. And companies are tapping into us creative individuals now and it's wonderful to see, it's called open innovation and it's becoming more and more popular. Well, I certainly like the idea of uh, open innovation and contributing to a larger conversation. I want to come back, though, to something you said. We work a lot with kids on hands-on projects and things, and you said that you discovered an art class. Now, was that in high school or college? When did you discover that? I was a sophomore in college. I was an economics major, and I was just struggling. I wasn't wild about it. I could, I could tell that my classmates really liked it, and I didn't like it that much. So. I figured I got to find something else. So just by chance, they had this one art class that the, the college offered. It was Santa Clara University and it was off campus. It was this little building. And I showed up one day and I met the professor and right away something clicked. And I just loved it. And I could tell it was something, there was something there because I, time would just fly by and I, I found myself I, I just wanted to go back to it and back to it and I, I remember I went home and I told my dad I, w I wanted to be an artist and he said you know Steve you know do, do you do you draw and I said no and he said do you, well you must paint and I said well no and he said <laughs> well you, you want to be a sculptor right and I said uh, I'm not sure and he said well why don't you go ahead and see if this is right for you my dad gave me a tremendous amount of freedom to try something new and I, I really, I, looking back, that was very, as a parent now, that was a, that was a smart move for him. And but he had that. I don't know why or or when he's. I, I don't know how he came to that conclusion to let me pursue my dreams, but he did. And I could not thank him enough for that. Yeah, that's an that's an interesting thing to say to a kid. I mean, my my dad. I'm not sure my dad would have said that. He might have but I'm not sure. I mean, I, I always had crazy ideas, and I don't know if you have this problem, but you can't ever shut them off like you're walking in the grocery store and an idea hits. Like, does that happen to you? You can never turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so my dad must have been aware of it, and I think it he's got it a little bit too, but I think if I just said, you know, I wanted to be an artist, I mean, I don't know. I, you know, he probably would have said yes. My, my dad's really cool about that because there's a crazy story about us floating down a river and about killing ourselves. So, And it was because of an idea I had. <laughs> and he, he, okay. came, he came with me. So he might have said yes, actually. But a lot of parents don't say yes when kids come up with crazy ideas. Then. But kids need that ability to fail and to try something. I think you're absolutely right. This whole – I don't think you ever truly fail. I think you, you're just going through the process. So – I could wallpaper my house with people telling me no or <laughs> rejections. It doesn't really bother me. It actually motivates me more to, to try to figure out what, how could I change it? What could I do differently? So it motivates me. Maybe some people it might slow down, but it doesn't. Uh, I know what I want to do and I'm going to do it. So my father, I think, saw that I was very determined. He could tell that whenever I put my mind to something, I was going to complete it. So he just let me go. And it worked out fine and he knew I'd figure it out. It took me a little bit longer. My mentor was someone I met in my early 20s that just changed my life completely. And I remember taking my father down to meet this individual, his name's Steve Askin, he's still a good friend of mine. And he did, I said, am I crazy? And he said, no, you're on track. If you have that creativity, and that drive, you're a real special individual, and there is a place for you. And he showed me how to find my place, and that, that's what I've been trying to share with other people. If you have that dream, aspiration, there's a place for you, and you just have to find it and have people to, to support you to find it as well. My father did, and so, so did this mentor, Steve Askin. Let's dig into that, what you said just a minute ago, because I think this is an important thing. Um, and I think I'm still grappling with this a little bit. Where did the determination come from? I mean, you said you could wait, you know, paper your your house with the nose that you've gotten from all the things you you've heard. 
but that that doesn't bother you too much. And I, I would say I had to grow that. Like, I didn't come wired like that. I mean, it used to be that when someone said it and gave me a no, I get depressed. Now, I've changed that recently. Now, now when I have an idea and I know it's a good idea, I say, well, whatever. You just don't know the idea well enough or maybe, you know, maybe it's just not for you. So how did you get that? I think I learned that playing sports, that you were going to win some or lose some. And I think I learned early on, working hard, you would be competitive if you just put the time in. And I figured that out early on, that it was just a matter of working hard towards something, that you'll achieve it. So I I think I picked that up in sports and carried it on to my career, kind of, that I was just going to outwork the next guy. I was just going to work harder. (laughs) And I think it does pay off if, if you realize some things take a little bit longer than others. Most people will give up. You only fail when you give up. Now, that's absolutely true. If you never give up, you don't fail. (laughs) It's safe, but not very fun. I never took it, well, maybe I did take it personal, because I was so determined to change their mind (laughs) that I thought I'd come back, and I thought they said, no, they just don't have enough information. All right, so I just keep on coming back. It didn't, uh, it hurt, and maybe, maybe it does hurt. Maybe it hurts so much that I want to fix it. I don't want to change it. Maybe I do care a lot, So, but it wasn't enough for me to stop. That's an interesting perspective because I, I think we're kind of in that place. You know, we're, in, we're still in startup phase with the company. And when you hear no, it's hard not to take it personally sometimes. But, but I guess for me, what, what I've done is I've looked ahead. You know, I see where we're going. I know what we're creating, and I know it's something that's valuable, something that, that we need to create. And for me, it's the... There's just a mission deep down that I know I have to do. There was an article recently in the Wall Street Journal about failure, and they asked five people to talk about failure, and I forgot her name. She was in the fashion industry, and she, she it was beautiful the way she wrote it because she said, look, you're going to have difficult times, and you're going to question yourself, but never question your mission. Never question uh, your goals keep that on track and and you'll just be able to get through the failure they'll just fall through the wayside if you keep your mission and your goals on track and I think that's the big picture I think you're absolutely right if you stay true to that mission you will achieve it and failure won't be a big deal at all I'd like to take a little bit of a left turn and head toward education because I know that a lot of our listeners come from uh, from the educational side so if you think back you know, over your educational experience, you said you thought you failed second grade. <laughs> I mean, tell us a little bit about the experience of you know kind of going through it, the school environment from you know grade school, middle school, high school. I really struggled in school. In fact, I remember that I, I was failing, and I, re, I would hide all the papers in, in my bedroom. In fact, actually, it's not my bedroom. It was a tree. I had a, a fort, a treehouse, and I hid all the my elves underneath the carpet and it got so big that my parents saw this big lump and, and they, they knew something was wrong and once they, they saw that they realized I was struggling so they I had a tutor for years as long as I can remember I had a tutor and it worked a little bit but not it didn't work that well so when I was in high school I wanted to play sports but my grades weren't good enough so my parents once again I had tutors and I, I always felt I was very intelligent but school I struggled and and so later, I never, even going through college, I never thought there'd be a job for me because some, I knew I had a learning disability. I didn't know why or what, but things that were easy for people were not easy for me. So I created my own job, basically making things and looking back, and that's what I did. So I kind of fell through the cracks a little bit. I was tested when my kids were getting ready to go to college. My wife was very involved in the education started a couple charter schools and I wanted to go back I left college early without my degree and I wanted to go back and get my degree I'm 50 years old now and I went back and the dean of the the school because I had been out for so long said Steve you have to go back for a full year and I said well I don't have time so she called me back and said what's the problem I said well school is really hard for me and I just don't have the time she said have you ever been tested so I was tested and they came back with the results and it came back just horrible. It was the, the scores were so low. They said, Mr. Key, there, we don't think there's anything you can do in society to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> and this is recently, right? This is about 10 years ago. Okay. <laughs> and I kind of smiled be- and I knew it, but I had created 
my own world and I was you know, successful in creating ideas. So I had to kind of chuckle and I went back to the dean and I sh showed them the testing and sure enough, they, they had me do a couple of things and I graduated finally with my degree after all those years. So <laughs> I think people just learn differently. I think so. And, and I think I'm probably the sharpest guy on the planet. But when it comes to writing i mean i'm an author but i don't write books and i got around i found a way of of um getting around obstacles right and that's what i found a way that if i if i have a hard time writing i i found a ghost writer and i would do audio and i just found ways around i didn't let any obstacle stop me i knew i was going to have to work a little harder than the next guy because i have some difficulties but those actually became assets so I'm very fortunate that I found a, a, a place for me, and uh, given all the obstacles I have, I've had along the way, so I think anybody can do it. I don't care what obstacles you have in front of you. If you really want it, you can do it, and I want to help people do that. That's amazing. I think that you would have really thrived in uh, what my wife and I do. We've kind of latched on to the maker movement and uh, use that as kind of a springboard because I've always, I guess in my mind, I've always been an inventor. I don't know how, to, I mean, I, I guess I technically I have a couple of patents, but they don't make money, mostly because they were patented for different reasons than for making money. But I got the bug after I got a 3D printer. And it, I mean, it's really hard not to get the bug after printing off a couple of things and then going to a little 3D modeling program and making something and then printing something you just made and manufacturing it in your house. I mean, that is, that's fascinating. It's exciting. It's just crazy. And we just love getting kids in and having them use the tools and giving them a challenge. And we, the truth is we found almost no difference between the kids, say, in Thousand Oaks where the parents work at, you know, Raytheon or Teledyne or, you know, one of the prime contractors and kids in rural North Carolina. I grew up in Western Carolina and we go back to see my parents in the summer. And there's a little town called Murphy in North Carolina. And we brought our boot camp with us. We, we packed it up in the back of the car and drove it across the country in our RV. And we did this in Western Carolina. And the kids are the same. We get the same kinds of solutions. They're creative, they're interested. And as soon as the kids understand that it's okay if they break a couple of things, their creativity goes through the roof and they just create things that are fascinating and interesting. I believe, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that. I, I think at a certain age, we're all creative and somehow we lose that a little bit. I don't know. I remember in school where people would say, well, you know, you're good at this and you're good at that. And it kind of separated people a little bit. And, and maybe that creativity, we lose that along the way somewhere. I'm glad to hear that because I think I think we're all creative and I think you need to build I think that it's like a muscle that needs to be exercised and we don't do enough of it. And education is, is, is to me is really learning how to figure something out and there was a great article about Google and who they hire and they hire people just like just like what you said that that are problem solving. It's not their background. It's not their education. It's not any of those things. They give them these small things to do and they see if they can complete it by figuring it out. And I thought that was really, truly amazing now because that's a skill anybody can have, right? It doesn't matter if your economic background, it's huge. I mean, if you think back, I mean, I think back to being a kid. I mean, I grew up in Western Carolina, like I said, and we had trees everywhere because there's trees everywhere back east. So we would go into the woods and we would build stuff. I distinctly remember building a teeter-totter that I thought was going to be amazing. It was like six feet tall in the middle, and I thought this was going to be fantastic. And I, I actually, my brother and I built it out in the front, and we put this huge log across the top. I mean, because if you have a six-foot fulcrum in the middle, and you know, you got to have a pretty big log to, you know, to use as the main bar across the top. I don't even know how we got it up there, actually thinking about it. I don't remember how we did that, <laughs> but it didn't work because it's too high and you can't jump high enough to get the center of mass to shift. But I didn't know that. But none of that ever stopped us from building stuff. And like you said, I mean, no one ever tested me and said, hey, do you know how to build a six foot tall teeter totter? I mean, we just went out and did it and, you know, to see what to see what would happen. You know, I, I had a lab under the stairs. I mean, called it my lab. Because I, I got a ham radio license um, when I was in, I want to say, 6th or 7th grade, or 8th, yeah, 6th or 7th grade. 
and we had to pass a little electronics thing to get our license. And so I got interested and started going down to the local radio shack and, and you know getting the little books about how to wire stuff up. And I think about one in ten things actually worked and the rest of it didn't. But I was down there figuring it out, having fun. I mean, did you do stuff like that? I built models. I loved building ships and planes. Anything that had to do with the military, I built. I was fascinated by things that were very small, that were that took a really fine coordination of your hand to, to put it together. And I could spend hours building things. But I lost, you know, it's funny, when looking back, my room was complete. There wasn't a space in that room that didn't have something on it. <laughs> I collected everything, and then my brother's room didn't have anything in it. And we were that different. So I could tell it at a very early age, products, things I was curious about. And then after I hit junior high, that kind of just went away. It became sports, and I got distracted. But it came back around. I, I remember in high school, I, I had a woodshop class. And it was one of those things, again, where I, I didn't want to leave. I just wanted to build. <laughs> and then I didn't really put my finger on it. I never thought that was going to be something I would do. My father didn't work with his hands, so I didn't really observe him building things. And then, in, of course, in college, everything changed for me again. I found something I really like. And it's that creation that you're finding with 3D printing. Yeah. It's that sense of from my head to the paper to, like, I can touch it. I mean, there's nothing more magical than that, right? I mean, that's oh, yeah. like, oh yeah, it's the best. <laughs> it is the best part. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if anybody wants it. I don't care if it's marketable. You made it from your idea. That to me is the is the magical part of, of all of it, to see it, touch it, feel it. The next step is, of course, seeing it on the store shelf when other people can enjoy it too. How does that feel, by the way? I've brought quite a few products to market. It's never like the first time. <laughs> it's overwhelming because, I don't know, it's it's almost like the world can see it now, right, that you can share it. You know, it's funny. A lot of people think about the money aspect of it never crossed my mind. I was never really motivated by that. I wanted to, to see my creations and have other people experience it too. My first things were I was designing stuffed animals and FAO Swartz, a big toy company in New York. I remember my first designs were there and I was in New York and I, I couldn't believe I was in New York and there were my creations that I had made in my little office. and. Now they were selling in toy stores. It was the most remarkable feeling uh, ever. I've never quite had that same feeling ever since. Well, we very much enjoy seeing that because it seems like that happens a lot more with kids, that they get excited or tickled uh, when, they, when they make something, and it seems to happen over and over again, particularly when they have a big challenge and they have to overcome some obstacles and they hit you know, some frustration along the way. And then when it finally works... I mean, you know, you get cheers and jumping up and down and, you know, the, the yes fist pump and all of it. I mean, you just get everything. And it's it, empowering. I had one particular idea that had been patented years and years ago, but no one brought it to market, didn't know how to manufacture it. And that was a problem that I ended up spending probably six months trying to solve. And once we figured it out, there was really a sense of I can do anything. That's what I think what we do at one of my companies is teach people. They think it's inventing, and I think it's it's larger than that. I think it's tackling any goal and completing and giving you the confidence to, to look at anything, study it, observe it, try to solve a problem, and getting to the end. And that, that whole process is so empowering that it allows me to think that I can do anything now. So, <laughs> And I see other people feel the same way. So that's how I look at that, that fist pump in the air and – God, that's like, you can't beat it. Right? Yeah, we, we definitely want to spread that. So we're getting close to the end of our time, and I want to ask two questions, and I think Cindy sent you the questions, so we'll just jump right in. In the age of Google and Wikipedia, what does it mean to be educated? I love the library that we have that's available to us today. From researching, I'm a researcher. I, if I've got a question, I can find the answer might not be the right answer, it's somebody's answer. <laughs> so, okay, so I do recognize that, but I do like that I can sit, and I think that every topic in the world has been written on. But that's where you start. That's all it is. It's a starting place for me. Now, through observation, through trying something by learning the history of something, that now I take my education further. 
So I think it's a wonderful tool. It's not the tool. It's part of the tool. And you just use that one tool in your toolbox for education. So the related question we like to ask is, what is the purpose of an education? And that's kind of a, oh. a, a deeper philosophical question. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question because my wife was a teacher for 10 years. And because of my struggle with education and her devotion to education, that I think we both have come to the same place. To me, it's not about memorizing. It's not about maybe the old way of, of learning. It's not about test taking. It's about getting people to think and, and wonder and question and curiosity. If you have curiosity, you never stop learning. And I think we're always going to, and I like to look at myself as that way. I'm never, every day is a new day. I learn things every single day. The older I get, the more I, I realize I don't know. So I think education never stops. And I think that's the way education should be taught in schools. It's more hands-on, more problem-solving, more thinking. Wow. I don't think we could end better than that. So I think we're going to wrap it right there, put a nice, neat little bow on it. Thank you so much, Stephen, for taking some time to talk to our audience today. And what is the best way for them to get in touch with you if they have questions or just uh, want to uh, reach out a little bit? It's very simple. It's my full name, Stephen Key. And that's spelled S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Stephen Key at Invent, I-N-V-E-N-T, Write. You want to always invent Write, R-A-G-H-T dot com. That's my personal email. Love to hear what anybody has to say. And I tell everybody, keep believing, do it, get off the couch, have fun, keep inventing. You'll love it. Creativity is the way to go. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you, Steve. If you've been enjoying the conversations and insights here on the podcast, share it with a friend. Great ideas demand to be shared. You can also help fellow parents and educators by subscribing to the Tabletop Inventing podcast in iTunes, leaving a rating, and writing a review. If you use Android, subscribe, leave us a rating, and write a review in Stitcher. Links to subscribe can be found at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast. Contact us, and we'll think through the comments and answer your questions here in the podcast. And be sure to let us know if you'd like a shout-out or to remain anonymous. You can share your comments and questions at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast or by emailing us at podcast at ttinvent.com. Let's discuss your thoughts and questions. Join us again next time when we will again seek to answer the question, What is the purpose of an education? And as educators, how do we awaken the inventor in each of our students? Mm -hmm.